And let's warm up our singing voices by greeting the morning with Carrie Day. Gathered here in the mystery of the hour, gathered here in one strong body, gathered here in the struggle and the power, spirit draw near. Brenda Jackson. I'm the service leader this morning. I was born in the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation and have lived most of my life here in Treaty 6 territory, specifically in Edmonton, the place known for millennia as Amiskwichis Waskahikan. This is a traditional meeting ground and home to many Indigenous peoples, including Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, and the Nakota Sioux. I acknowledge that as a settler and resident here, I am a treaty person. As treaty people, we are partners in the stewardship of the land we all rely on, responsible for the impacts of our choices, responsible to the ancestors and who came before us, responsible to future generations of all our people collectively. This morning, we are delighted to have Miranda Jimmy, founder of Rise Edmonton, back with us to help us deepen our understanding of the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People and what it means to be an ally in this ongoing struggle for justice. Our musicians are Carrie Day and Rebecca Patterson. And this morning, whomever you love, Whatever your theology or lack thereof, we invite all people of good faith to join this compassionate, free-thinking community to rest, grow, and serve the world. Welcome, bienvenue, tawa, there is room for you here. Now, as is our custom, I invite you to bring your chalice or candle forward, and we will light it together. With humility and courage, born of our history, we are called as Unitarian Universalists to build the beloved community where all souls are welcome as blessings and the human family lives whole and reconciled. With this vision in our hearts and minds, we light our chalice. Each week we gather together, we bring with us sorrows, we bring with us celebrations. And we take a moment during our service each week to invite you to share those joys or concerns in the chat. And since it's the last week of the month, we also celebrate all of January birthdays. So I invite you to 
type in the name of anyone near and dear to you whose birthday you would like to celebrate today as well. Happy birthday indeed to all of you. Please join me in the affirmation of our candles. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. The offertory to me is always a moment of gratitude in the day, a moment 
when I can think about all of the things that I receive from this community and be thankful for the opportunity to give back. We give back in many ways. We give back with our time and volunteer service. And it's really important that we give back with our financial support as well, because we couldn't bring these services to you. We couldn't have our professional staff. We couldn't have our office support and all those things that make this community run without the support of our friends. So this is your moment when we I invite you to reflect on that and the things that you receive from this community. And also uh, a reminder that we have a fundraising auction, fundraising auction coming up on February 18th to 28th. And you have an opportunity to participate in that as well. So on our website, you can find ways to donate. There's a donate button right at the top. and. Uh, also, you can find out more information about the auction and how to participate in that. And on February 28th, we're going to have a fa fabulous wind up with the amazing local musician Martin Kerr performing for us. So if any of you know Martin, you know you want to be there. From you, I receive to you I give, together we share, and from this we live, together I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. And now I'm going to turn over the mic to our guest speaker, Miranda Jimmy. We are very pleased to have Miranda back with us. Thank you all for being here this morning. I want to start by acknowledging that I too am gathered on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of the Blackfoot, the Cree, the Dene, Nakota Sioux, and Soto, and later the Métis and settlers and descendants of settlers. Here on the banks of what's now known as the North Saskatchewan River, Indigenous people have been coming from across Turtle Island to gather, trade, teach, learn, and celebrate. And I hope it's that same spirit that brings us all together today. I want to start with this image, um, which was taken on the banks of the North Saskatchewan uh, at Ramsey Crescent. If people are familiar with walking in the River Valley, you might know this place. Um, over the pandemic, I have visited it often. Um, it overlooks uh, looking west. Uh, you'll see the Twilliger footbridge and further west, if you're looking really closely, you'll see um, the Cameron Heights bridge that goes over the Anthony Hende and further west. The reason I wanted to start with this particular image is because um, this is the place, this is the land of um, the uh, Muskegosic, the land of the, the people of medicine land, um, the traditional name of Enoch. Uh, and if you know the history of Enoch, uh, their, their traditional land stretches across Treaty 6, um, but specifically when they signed treaty, um, they were given an allotment of land um, that is basically equivalent to 156th Street and West. Um, and if you've ever visited Enoch in present day, that is not their current allotment. Um, and so I want to start with this image of uh, traditional territory, of agreements of land, uh, and the juxtaposition of our, our current reality. I also want to start with this place of uh, forward movement which is a theme for Westwood this year and the theme of vulnerability for this month. Uh, if we are to think about being allies to Indigenous people, it is about forward movement. It is about respect for the past and the ancestors who have come before us, the agreements that were made, the honoring of those agreements, 
and our ability as individuals to move those forward. This requires our own vulnerability. This requires us to be um, humble, acknowledge the mistakes that have been made, and make efforts in our daily lives and in our actions and in our words to reconcile that, that past um, and do better going forward. All of those have, have to be intentional. All of those have to be action oriented and all of those have to come with the respect and honor that one day we will be ancestors and future generations will be looking back to us and our actions to see what we have done and the mistakes that we have made, but also the good things that we have done, the good steps we took to move forward in a good way together. Today, I'm going to pose to you some questions. Um, think of these more as rhetorical questions. We're not gonna have it, we're not gonna have time or the possibility to really have a discussion as I talk with you today, but I just want you to reflect on these questions, both for a personal check-in to see where you're at, um, to be honest with yourself, um, perhaps to spark conversation in your, in your homes after today's service, perhaps to spark conversation in our gathering after the service is over. But ultimately, this is about a true conversation with yourself. Um, if we are going to move forward in a good way, if we are going to be respectful of one another, it starts with right relations with our own, with ourself, being honest, being vulnerable, and being truthful with where we are and how far we need to go. Next slide, please. So what does that good relationship look like? What is allyship? According to the dictionary, Miriam Webster says, it's the state or condition of being an ally, supportive association with another person or group, specifically an association with the members of a marginalized or mistreated group in which one does not belong. Allyship is an interesting word. It's uh, become, uh, I would say, pretty commonplace in the social justice world lately, uh, this idea of allyship, but often we don't take the time to reflect on what does that actually mean. From my experience outside looking in, I would say that allyship is a value of Westwood and the congregation. I would say that there is a commitment to being allies to those who are marginalized or struggling. I have witnessed that in my invitation to participate and speak with you um, now for the second occasion. I've uh, been invited along with the volunteers of RISE to deliver a blanket exercise to the congregation of Westwood. Uh, I have spent the last three weeks with many of you in circle having a conversation about these very um, values. So I would say that allyship is a value of Westwood. Next slide, please. But what actually makes you an ally? So you can belong to a group that values allyship, but what as an individual makes you an ally? According to, uh, according to the dictionary, an ally is one that is associated with another as a helper, a person or group that provides assistance and support to an ongoing effort activity or struggle. This is someone who makes that commitment and to an effort and an effort to recognize that privilege works uh, in opposition off time, often to oppressed groups. And they need to honor that privilege by recognizing that they have a role in solidarity. Allies commit to reducing their own complicity in oppression and invest in strengthening their own knowledge and awareness of oppression. Ally is an action word. It is based on your individual actions. It is not based on membership to a group that values allyship. It is not a name that you can call yourself. It is one that you are recognized 
by those marginalized groups as being because of the work that you do. There also may be times where your efforts as an ally actually work in opposition to those values. Ally needs to be a continual effort and there are, there are ebbs and flows to that where we may be participating actively and may need to step away or may make a misstep where allyship is not demonstrated. Next slide, please. So I want you to take a moment and think about those words allyship and ally. One of the ways that we um, can think about that and think about our own actions and think about how that ebbs and flows in our own life is uh, through something called the allyship continuum. Uh, next. So it starts with being apathetic. So not knowing, apathetic doesn't mean that you don't care. It means that you don't know. So there may be people in the room today that are apathetic to Indigenous issues. Um, you may be apathetic to other marginalized groups. Uh, you may not know enough about the disability community or um, those with gender difference or um, newcomers or refugees or um, religious uh, difference. Those are all ways that we can be apathetic. And I think it's important that we recognize to ourselves that we can't know everything about every single person. And there are moments that we need to be honest to say, even though I'm an ally to this group, I know nothing about this group. Um, and that makes me apathetic to their cause. Next, please. The next stage is aware. So this means that you have some awareness of the issues of that marginalized group. Um, you know that they struggle, you know a little bit about the differences that they have and the challenges they have um, with mainstream society. Um, you may know a little bit about how they're different than you. You may know people who belong to those groups. So you are aware on a basic level about the struggles that they have. My experience has been that most non-Indigenous uh, or settler or descendant of settler people belong to one of these two categories when we talk about Indigenous issues. And this is not to point fingers or place blame. This is about being honest about where you sit um, on the allyship continuum. So again, to check in with yourself about that word ally and allyship, about where is it that you actually sit. So you may have general awareness. You may be sitting here today listening to me speak or been here in March when I joined the congregation then and spoke. Um, so you're generally aware um, and, and maybe that's where you're sitting. Next, please. The next step is active. You are actually taking that awareness, you are seeking knowledge, you are sharing knowledge, and you are actively uh, engaged in learning. So this is the, the third step. Um, so being active and being a learner, being um, actively seeking knowledge is a good thing. It is about building up your toolkit it is about building up your capacity. It is about sharing that knowledge with those around you in your group. This is where the action of allyship starts. You are seeking out knowledge. You are understanding. You are sharing that knowledge with others. Next, please. The last step is to advocate. So this is when action becomes a regular part of your routine. You are actively seeking out knowledge, not because it's being brought to you, not because a news story tells you to go seek out the knowledge. This is part of your everyday routine. You are an ally to a particular group of people because you are actively every single day engaged in allyship, which is about seeking out that knowledge, not because it is being presented to you, but because you are actively doing it. 
you are also actively finding ways to include those marginalized voices in the work that you do. You are spending time in your circles and your conversations, inviting those voices in and making sure that they are represented in the actions that you take. Like I said, there are times when we bounce in between these, these areas, depending on what's going on in our lives, or we may be further along on the continuum for particular groups that are um, important to us or um, we are connected to in different ways. The challenge today is to think about where you sit with allyship and how do you move that along? How do you make it part of your daily routine um, and part of the actions that you take and become second nature to all the decisions and conversations that you're involved in. Next slide, please. So what makes you an ally to Indigenous peoples? How do you make action and take action in your daily lives? From what I've heard uh, from many voices in the congregation, there is very little Indigenous representation in the, the membership of this group. So what do you as individuals do on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure that you are being an ally to Indigenous people if those voices and perspectives are not present in your day-to-day? -day? Why are Indigenous issues important to you? Next slide, please. So back to the continuum. Are you starting at the apathetic or aware stage of Indigenous issues and Indigenous allyship? Are you sometimes active? Are you sometimes an advocate? Have you even stepped into those areas yet? I think when we talk about Indigenous rights and Indigenous issues, it's really about human rights and the respect that we have for individuals, uh, individual rights and freedoms, those that we should expect every person in Canada to have. And the truth is that Indigenous people don't have basic human rights right now. So if human rights are important to you, um, I would like you to bring that a little bit closer to home and think about Indigenous rights and think about the discrepancy uh, between human rights and Indigenous rights in Canada. For those of you who participated in the workshops over the last three weeks, I'd like you to just reflect on what have you done since Tuesday? Are you still in the awareness stage? Have you moved to active? Have you moved to advocate? Today, I wanna to talk to you about a specific Indigenous issue that everyone in the circle today can have a direct impact on. Uh, there's an Indigenous battle that's going on in Canada that you may not be aware of, you may be apathetic to, you may have a bit of awareness about. Maybe you're active on it and maybe you're advocating, but the call to you today is to join those processes, join that action. So today I want to tell you about the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and an opportunity to demonstrate your allyship that will actually have a present day impact and may have an impact for generations to come. Next slide, please. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People was um, intended to enshrine rights that constitute the minimum standards for their survival 
dignity, and well-being of Indigenous peoples of the world. It contains 46 articles and is an international standard for the rights of Indigenous people to self-determination. So what does self-determination mean? It means the right to um, have ownership, uh, determining what is right and wrong, what is appropriate, what is acceptable for um, culture, community, um, and, and being able to make their own decisions. Uh, in 1982, the UN established a working group on Indigenous populations, and the working group um, developed the first draft of the UN Declaration, um, short, for short called UNDRIP. Um, and that went to a subcommittee of the UN in 1994. On September 13th, uh, 2007, so 23 and a half years ago, the majority of UN countries, 144, voted in favor. Four countries voted against it. Australia, New Zealand, the United States, and Canada. Then uh, Minister of Indian Affairs for the Government of Canada, Chuck Strahl, explained the governance re government's reasoning by, I quote you, by signing, you default this document to saying that the only rights at play here are the rights of First Nations. And of course, in Canada, that's inconsistent with our constitution. Uh, in 2009 and 2010, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, uh, along with the US, reversed their positions and now are in support of UNDRA. However, support does not mean endorsement and does not mean implementation. So no longer on paper with the United Nations is Canada in opposition to this, but since 2010, not much has actually changed. Next slide, please. So what's actually covered in UNDRIP? Uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance to read it, I would encourage you to do that, um, to deepen your awareness stage of being an ally. Really, this is about human rights. And I wanna to read to you the first three articles of UNDRIP, um, word for word, with the exception, I'm going to take out the word indigenous from the, the words. People have right to full enjoyment as a collective or as individual to all human rights and fundamental freedoms as recognized by the Charter of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and International Human Law. If you agree with that, that all people should have access to that, right now, that's not the case for Indigenous people. Article 2. People are free and equal to all other people and individuals and have the right to be free from any kind of discrimination in the exercise of their rights, in particular, based on their origin or identity. So if you believe that all people should be free of discrimination, you should support the, the UN Declaration as well. Article three, people have a right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely demonstrate or determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. Again, that is the right to self-determination that is offered to every other person in Canada. The reason that Canada has not fully endorsed and adopted the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People is because we have something called the Indian Act. We are the only government that belongs to the UN that has a piece of federal legislation uh, signed on to as part of our constitution that says there is a separate a uh, set of rules based on cultural identity. We are the only country that has that, which is in direct competition or contradiction to the UN Declaration. It, going on through the 46 articles of UNDRIP, there um, is direct examples of um, the removal of forced assimilation, um, not allowing for the removal of children, uh, access to the same amount for education and housing, 
Um, all of those currently are not realities for Indigenous people in Canada. The biggest uh, contradiction that Canada and our constitution currently has um, against UNDRIP is the, um, is the duty to consent. So currently under federal legislation, uh, the government of Canada requires anyone um, entering into economic development um, on traditional lands of, uh, of Indigenous people in Canada, the duty to consult. And I think of um, consultation kind of on a continuum as well. Uh, it starts with um, the duty to consult. So there is a requirement by law that I talk to you about what I'm going to do. That checks the box uh, under federal requirements to say, I'm going to go um, you know, dig up oil on your traditional territory. In order to get the permit from the government, I have to consult with you, which means I have to talk to you and tell you about it. That checks the box. That is the bare minimum. Um, if you think about a continuum from the duty to consult, I would say there's a duty to engage. So um, a conversation that happens and engage with you and have your input be involved in, in the decision making. Um, from that is the duty to relationship. So no, I don't have to just talk to you about what I'm doing, but I have a responsibility to keep the conversation going after the project moves forward. What I think UNDRIP does, um, and is what's stated in several of the articles of UNDRIP, is the duty to consent. And this is about pre, free and informed consent to a project. So I don't just need to know about it as an Indigenous person. I need to know about it. I need to know all the information and I need to consent to what you're doing. So it's not, a it's not just about talking to me. It's not about listening to me. It's about me agreeing to your approach. And the duty to consent would mean drastic changes to resource development in our country, drastic changes to the, the role and responsibilities of other orders of government, like provincial and territorial and municipal. Um, and it would basically pull the rug out from under our constitution. The reason I'm bringing this to you today um, is because there is a conversation happening today, present day in our House of Commons. Next slide, please. Um, this, our, we have actually been present in the conversation around UNDRIP since the 1970s. Uh, pictured here is uh, former Grand Chief and former TRC Commissioner Wilton Littlechild, who is from Musquachese. He was part of that original UN working group that drafted the UN Declaration to the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and uh, has been present in the conversation since then. So in 2010, the Conservative government under Harper, um, like I said, reversed the decision and endorsed UNDRIP describing it as an aspirational document, but remained an objector to the declaration saying that it will never be applied in any tangible way in Canada because it undermines the constitution. In December 2014, uh, Indigenous MP uh, Romeo Sagamish introduced Canada's first UNDRIP bill, uh, private members bill C-641, it was defeated on its second reading in May of 2015. Fast forward a month later, June 2nd, 2015, the TRC released their 94 calls to action. And there are 25 uh, mentions of UNDRIP in that, including call to action 43. We call on the provincial, we call on the federal, provincial, territorial, and municipal governments to fully adopt and implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a framework for reconciliation. At that time, uh, we were leading up to a federal election, if you can take us back uh, five and a half years ago. And um, about 11 minutes after the 94 calls to action were released, 
then leader of the Liberal Party, Justin Trudeau, committed to implementing all 94 calls to action if he was elected as our Prime Minister. Well, that happened that fall. And um, shortly after that, he released his first budget, which uh, provided funding for one of the 94 calls to action and no mention of the UN declaration. Um, so in April 2016, um, Romeo introduced another private members bill, uh, the United ne Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, an act to ensure the laws of Canada are in harmony with UNDRIP. Uh, and so that was introduced to the House of Commons. Uh, it didn't pass its third reading. Uh, it did pass its third reading and went on to the, um, the Senate, but then died in the Senate because of uh, the call of the next election. Also in uh, May of 2016, uh, Minister Carol, Carolyn Bennett officially announced Canada's removal of a permanent objector. So um, in 20, 2010, uh, Harper had agreed to uh, the UN declaration but said it would never actually be implemented. 2016, that changed saying we would fully adopt and implement it within the laws of Canada, which is our charter. So again, there was a, a recognition to say, we'll adopt it as long as it fits within our current structure and system. Two months later, Minister of Justice Jody Wilson-Raybould described the adoption of UNDRIP as unworkable and a political distraction. So it went from agreement to it and uh, a promise of it to saying it's not really possible. December 3rd, 2020, uh, Minister David Lametti, Federal Minister of Justice, has introduced Bill C-15, an act respecting the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. The bill follows the Liberal Party of Canada's commitment to table legislation uh, within its first year. So this is a month ago, a little over a month ago, this happened. The bill has been introduced. It's now passed two readings. Um, since then, six provincial uh, provinces, including Alberta, have requested that the federal government put stops to UNDRIP legislation. Uh, and I quote, the draft bill can harm all communities, industry sectors, services, and Canadians. And the letter was signed by each provincial Indigenous Affairs Minister. Quote, Canada needs investor confidence now, especially when so many people are dependent on a decisive economic recovery. So now the objection is based on the pandemic happening and our economic situation. So uh, the process now sits with the, the federal government. So after the second reading of um, the, the bill, which has been introduced by the minority government and will require one of the other parties to also commit to it, it now sits with a parliamentary committee. Uh, the Parliamentary Committee will study it and will come back with either um, recommended changes or um, we'll put a stop to it at that point. Uh, when it comes back for its third reading after those changes or recommendations, um, it will require support of um, more than just the Liberal Party in order to pass. From that point, it then goes again to the Senate, um, which there's a possibility it could die there if we have a federal election called this spring, which is rumored to be happening. So we're back where we were five years ago, present day. Um, the one thing that I think can change, um, which I look again to you as allies and ally in this allyship is what is your role to play in this conversation? Are you apathetic to this conversation? Hopefully you're now aware um, what action can you take? What can you do to advocate? Something that I should also acknowledge and recognize is not everyone is happy with Bill uh, C-15. Um, if we remember the United Nations on the Rights of Indigenous People is based on the duty to consent. The Liberal Party drafted this legislation without any involvement from Indigenous people. And um, there is no expectation that the duty to consent 
is even part of this conversation because we're not involved in its development or approval at this point. The question I leave you with is, will you be on the right side of history? When we talk about that responsibility that we have to, um, to future generations, when they look back at us as ancestors, will they learn about this blip in the UNDRIP story as the same as five years ago where the bill died on the Senate floor or the House floor because nobody cared? Next slide, please. Ask yourself, should everyone in Canada be able to turn on the tap and drink clean water, feel safe in their own home, be treated equally regardless of culture or background, and have the opportunity to create a bright future for their next generation? We can all agree, everyone has the right to live free from harm and discrimination. And yet, Indigenous peoples in Canada still don't have their most basic human rights respected. That's why the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is so important. The UN Declaration is about working together to make Canada stronger. It's about a better, more equal future for all of us. We're making progress, but Canada can do better. It's time to move forward together. So I bring you back to this allyship continuum. I can tell you that everything I shared with you today about UNDRIP, um, I have had to seek out and be active in learning. This wasn't taught to me in school. I don't know anyone connected to this work. I have sought this out and kept the conversation going with those in my circle and with my elected officials because it's important to me. Um, I continue to be, even as an Indigenous person, more in the active category of this continuum. I'm still trying to find ways to advocate. Um, my provincial and uh, federal representatives and where I live are both conservative um, and have never answered any of the emails or letters that I've written to them. So I choose to advocate, but I feel like it falls on deaf ears. I also know that I have a responsibility to have conversations with those other members of parliament that are outside of my direct um, representation because they will be making a vote in the coming weeks and months on this issue. Uh, and they need to know what indigenous people feel about this, um, the importance of this decision and the responsibility they have in living up to who we say as Canadians that everyone is equal and has a right to human rights. Um, I think as Canadians, we have this belief in our hearts that that's who we are and that's what we practice, but it's not the truth. Um, adopting the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People offers us a step towards being more truthful, a step towards being more responsible, as a step towards being more equal. Hopefully after today, you are all more in the aware category and now have an option, a choice to make around proving your allyship, proving your uh, commitment to being an ally, being, treating others equally, holding up human rights. Those are the choices that you have. You can be apathetic, you can be generally aware, but you also can take action. And that is what I challenge you all to do today. Um, next slide, please. One of the things that I often get asked is, well, how do I be an ally? So I can learn, I can Google, I can have conversations, um, but I don't know that it actually makes a difference. So there's, um, there's a great um, little comic that goes on how to be an ally in training. I think it's, a, it's responsible, it's important that we think about um, 
allyship and being an ally as um, a journey as opposed to uh, a final end because we're constantly should be learning um, if you've ever heard the the saying the more i learn the more i realize i have how much i have to learn that is the role of an ally so um, step one in being an ally in training next slide um, is understanding your privilege so even as an Indigenous person, I have privilege. I have a house. I have food to eat. I have things to keep me entertained and friends and family around that care about me. And that provides me with privilege. It also provides me with time and energy that I can dedicate to this work without having to worry that my basic needs are not being met. So as a non-Indigenous person, you may have privilege in that you know directly who your elected officials are and you can call them up and they'll listen to you. You may be donors to political campaigns and that gives you privilege because you um, jump the queue in the conversation. You have privilege because maybe you are connected to a network of people that think like you and you have um, uh, can convince to join you on this journey. So all of those are privileged that you should be aware of and know that other people in this journey may not have access to. Next, please. Listen. Uh, goes back to the old saying, uh, you know, you've got two ears and one mouth because you should do twice as much listening as you do talking. If you don't belong to a marginalized group, your job, first and foremost, is to listen. This is not your lived experience. You don't come with the knowledge inherently um, or connected to many people that have this lived experience. So listen, understand what it is that you need to advocate for, what your role is in the conversation, um, and know that you are not to speak on anyone else's behalf. Next slide, please. So speak up, not over. So make sure that what you're, what you're sharing, what you're saying, the actions that you're taking are actually informed by the people it is going to impact the most. So um, often I say, um, there's, there's often you know, gatherings where academics or community members are speaking about a particular issue without having that lived experience, but they're the ones who have the privilege of being at the microphone. So when is it right for you to pass the microphone? So your privilege may bring you into spaces and places that other people don't have. How do you invite in and make sure that the voices and those who are impacted the most by the advocate, advocation that you're doing is, are directly there and can speak for themselves? And lastly, next slide. Know that mistakes happen. So allyship and being an ally is messy. Um, you're gonna stick your foot in your mouth. You're going to tick some people off. You're going to um, perhaps come with the best intentions, but still screw up anyways. That is part of the vulnerability that's required with allyship. When you mess up, when you tick someone off, take that as an opportunity to learn uh, take a step back, reevaluate, and approach things a little differently. Um, don't use it as an excuse to say, well, I tried and it went sideways, I'm out. Um, if we all stepped away every time we made a mistake, nothing would ever happen. So know that your work is important, know that your voice is important, um, and you have a responsibility to include others in those conversations and actions. And sometimes when you do that, you're going to make mistakes. Next slide. I just wanna say thank you for the invitation to today's conversation. Uh, hopefully some of the um, questions I asked you to think about and consider will sit with you after today, will spark further awareness, action and advocacy and um, know that I continue to um, offer support to this circle. 
uh, you can get a hold of me if, if you think I can help in that. Um, and the work that I do with RISE is also accessible if you need more information. Um, I, I welcome you to do that. I, I welcome the action uh, and I encourage the conversation to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda, for being with us again today and for giving us this information and these challenges about how to move forward. As we come to the close of our session this morning, our closing words are from Susan Carlson. We leave blessed by our connections to one another, to the spirit of life. Walk lightly that you see the life that is below your feet. Spread your arms as if you had wings and could dance through the air. Feel the joy of the breath in your lungs and the fire in your heart. Live to love and be a blessing on this earth. And we have one more musical offering from Carrie Day. One more step, we will take one more step till there is peace for us. And an important announcement about our service next week, it is the National Sharing Our Faith Service in which we will be joining the Canadian Unitarian Council for this national service. So it will be at 11 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, not our usual 1030. And you will need to go to the Westwood website and get the link for that because it's a different link than the one we usually do. So if you go there ahead of time, uh, you can click on that link and it will register you and they will send you the link. So you're all set up to go. So I would encourage you to do that quickly. 